You ready? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Tom Christensen. I'm the director of the China and the World, World Program here at Columbia University. Um, today's session, uh, unlike some of ours, will be recorded. So uh, participants should realize that that's the situation in which we're operating. Um, we have a very special guest here, uh, one of our own, uh, Zhong Yuan Zoe Liu, who was a fellow here in the program. I'm going to give her a whole uh, bio, but the most important part of her bio, she was a fellow in the program, so she's part of the family. Um, and uh, we have a very tight-knit community here at China in the World uh, of over 50 former fellows. And uh, Zoe has been a champion, a very active uh, former fellow. She's currently the Maurice Greenberg Fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she has taught at a uh, very interesting Texas A&M Bush School program in Washington, D.C., a training program uh, for future leaders. Um, and uh, in addition to being a fellow here, she is uh, the author of two books, uh, the first, Can Bricks De-Dollarize the Global Financial System? Um, and I think your answer was no. Um, <laughs> and and uh, Sovereign Funds, How the Communist Party of China Finances Its Global Ambitions, which was her project when she was a China and the World Fellow, has become a blockbuster book at Harvard University Press, got a lot of attention, not just in academia, but around the world uh, about China's sovereign wealth, wealth funds. She has a PhD in international relations from the Johns Hopkins University. And uh, she got an MA at GW, and she got a BA at Jinan University, uh, Shandong Normal University in Jinan, China. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, today she's going to talk about breaking the dollar's monopoly, monopoly how China's regional de-dollarization initiative is reshaping international finance. And I'm really interested in this because it seems to me to run against the theme of that book about the BRICS not being able to de-dollarize the system. And now you're saying maybe China on its own will be able to de-dollarize. So I'm really fascinated. And um, just wanted to uh, welcome you back and keep coming because you're based in New York. Now you can come to all of our talks. We always love to see you. And uh, thank you for coming today and presenting your work. Thank you. Please welcome her. All right, thank you everybody for coming here today. And I have to say you know, the uh, China and the World program has been extremely uh, successful at uh, training, preparing future uh, academics, teachers, as well as people who are actually participating in the debate. And uh, obviously here we have a very tight community, although right now I'm not necessarily from, uh, affiliated with the university, but I'm still teaching. And I still teach um, uh, teach teach class on Chinese foreign policy, economic statecraft, or Asian energy security, depending on, upon the semester at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. So I'm still teaching. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, so you for, like that, right? You like that. Keep teaching. Right. It's important. So for for today. Uh, yes, my I, I'm going to talk about breaking the dollars monopoly, and um, you know you 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 will notice that the title here is not necessarily about the dollarization. It's not <laughs> you know that's like a bottom line. Me. You know the the bottom line bottom line first. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about the dollarization, and I'm going to explain why China has not necessarily be attempting to de dollarize. And in fact, I have argued that in a de dollarized world, perhaps China is going to be the single biggest loser. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, okay, so hopefully we are aligned there. <laughs> And uh, uh, there is another reason why I wanted to emphasize China's regional de-dollarization initiatives. This is because uh, although many people would argue that Chinese policymakers really want to internationalize the renminbi, but actually I would argue that no, actually not. Starting from 2009, the very first time that a Chinese policymakers uh, publicly talked about or expressed their concerns about their the security of their assets invested in dollar denominated assets was in the run in during global financial crisis in March 2009 when Jiabao uh, at that time was the premier of, of uh, the Chinese government at that time he specifically publicly talked about well he want he hopes that uh, the United States, the US government would stick to its commitment in terms of maintaining or protecting the safety of a Chinese asset. And then a few months later, you have them, uh, the Pe People's Bank of China, Governor Zhou Xiaochuan, 
talked about, wrote this uh, three page article really about two, point and, two, point, two pages and a half article published by Bank of International Settlement. In that article, he for the first time talked about the necessity of diversifying the global financial system. And then fast forward, even today, even uh, given the shock of uh, Western collective sanctions against Russia, including the seize or the fr the freezing of Russian uh, reserves, including uh, foreign 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 uh, reserves deposited abroad or gold, um, Chinese policymakers still have not pub publicly talked about dethroning the dollar. And yet they have been focusing on talking about strengthening China's financial security in terms in an extreme geoeconomic scenario, especially during a financial warfare. Therefore, the bottom line of the conversation today is that we have to be careful about understanding the narratives of de-dollarization, dethroning the dollar versus renminbi internationalization. And uh, so I will quickly go over the research question as well as the literature review. And I wanted to also to conceptualize and measure the dollar's dominant currency status, because here we read the headline news. Sometimes people get confused in terms of de-dollarization. What does that mean, dethroning the dollar's reserve currency status? Or what does that mean? Why people get, get freaked out when China uh, and Argentina or China and other countries try to settle their bilateral trade using local currency um, and things like that. So we want to conceptualize what does that mean when we talk about the dollar's dominant currency status, what are the three major areas? And then I wanted to move forward to talk about if for any country who wanted to uh, de-dollarize or attempt to diversify the global financial system, what are the ways that they can do it? Or in other words, the pathways to de-dollarization. And in particular here, I want to emphasize that international trade, international exchange, really by nature, it takes at least two parties. In other words, if the Chinese government wanted to unilaterally de-dollarize, want to unilaterally impose the use of renminbi in bilateral trade or international settlement, that would not work because you need your counterpart to agree to take your currency. And then finally, I wanted to talk about why it is going to be very difficult for China to attempt to de-dollarize, let alone dethrone the dollar. But it is possible for China to scale up regional de-dollarization initiative, specifically for the purpose of promoting bilateral trade or investment. And then finally, Q&A. So uh, the research question really is about um, how rising powers can mitigate the risk of co uh, coercive financial statecraft exercised by a dominant power in the international system. And in other words, uh, policymakers would rephrase this as sanction resilience, how the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians or any other revisionist power or power, powers that are subject to U.S. sanctions or Western sanctions, how could their economy be resilient? And this is relevant for the current policy, res uh, po academic research in terms of deterrence, as well as for the policy discussion about Taiwan. Uh, you know, people have been trying to ask this question, what lessons have Beijing learned from uh, Russia's war against Ukraine and the West sanction, especially the G7's collective sanction against against Russia. So perhaps uh, if you were, if you think about, if you sit in Zhongnan, have you been through the lens of Xi Jinping, obviously, you know, this de decoding his mind, some people would say, is like decipher a um, Latin version of the Bible and uh, we happen to not be able to uh, speak Latin or read in Latin. However, uh, people, you know, you can think about this, if you view it from that lens, perhaps in order, a direct consequence of a military conflict with, with regard to Taiwan would incur perhaps severe financial sanctions from by the West, led by the United States. Now, knowing that perhaps a necessary step is to sanction proof the Chinese economy. Now, in order to sanction-proof the Chinese economy, you hear President Xi Jinping have been emphasizing a lot of self-sufficiencies from supply chains to uh, technology and innovation, and of course, including the financial and economic system. So 
in the current literature, the most popular literature now would be the weaponized interdependence. And Professor Henry Farrell is he actually has a new book coming out now, and uh, I haven't finished reading it. I just got it. Um, but uh, there are also other pre prior research. Uh, related to this. On the one hand, if you think about start from the very basic, looking at what, what are the how scholars, in particular economists, conceptualize the dollar's dominant status, current uh, the do dollar's dominant currency status. You have Gita Gopinath as well as her colleagues conceptualize this framework, talking about dollar's currency, uh, the dominant currency paradigm, specifically emphasizing the role of the US dollar in international trade settlement in, or trade invoicing and in reserve currencies in development finance and so on and so forth. And then for in the political economy literature, you also have um, uh, Cynthia Roberts and Katata, the USC, talking about the collective financial statecraft, the idea that you have a, the a group of rising powers can get together exercising their interest, both in terms of positive coercive, but more importantly, in terms of non-coercive powers. And then uh, related to this, obviously, the godfather status in terms of uh, economic statecraft, we can go all the way to Hirschman. He actually talks about exit, the, you know, his exit voice and the loyalty. You, you, can, you can get the sense of under what the circumstances revisionist powers could potentially um, exercise their voice within the existing system. And when they feel frustrated, perhaps it's the, there is a stronger incentive to exit. And the leveraging this literature with Iliad, uh, with Lloyd uh, Gruber, his go it alone power. Now you realize, okay, rather than simply quit, exit the existing system, you can also go it alone by setting up your own institutions with the idea of, on the one hand, you simply have your own. It's prestigious, uh, pursue a higher degree of autonomy. And then on the other hand, you can also pressure changes from outside of the existing system. And you, you also have um, um, Dr. Cohen talking about a currency status, the idea that countries or powers to pursue uh, currency, the currency, currency, uh, the prestigious status of their currency, international finance, not necessarily just for economic reasons, but also for prestige. And we build all this together. Actually, we can start from conceptualize the dollar's dominant currency status, specifically because for any power that attempts to break the dollar's monopoly, you literally can try to try through these three different areas, real economy, funding, and investability. So this is how I conceptualize it in terms of real economy. In terms of the dollar obviously dominates the real economy, both in terms of global reserves. Uh, as of yesterday, the US dollar still dominates about 58.8% uh, 50, of global reserves, whereas the Chinese renminbi was only 2% of global reserves. So by that measure, the dollar still dominates in global reserves. And then obviously, despite the rise of renminbi's share in SDR basket, still the US dollar it dominates the, the weight in the SDR basket. And then in terms of trade invoicing, in terms of uh, payment infrastructure, as well as commodity pricing, these are all the structural, uh, structural barriers that confines any other cu currencies intend to challenge the US dollar. You know, payment infrastructure, for example, would be uh, perhaps you know two years ago nobody would pay attention to SWIFT or CIPS the Chinese version now everybody understand what they are right and uh, the traffic flow on within the in existing international financial infrastructure are mostly denominated by the U.S. dollar that's the sort of the structural power in the existing system and then in terms of the commodity pricing a very good example it would be the global oil market. We, it doesn't matter where you are trading in Dubai, in Japan, in Singapore, in Texas, in London, there is only one global oil market. People don't talk about global oil markets because oil is very much fungible, right? However, commodity pricing is very relevant and is very important for our global financial system going forward, specifically because right now the system is based upon petrodollar and we perfected the petrodollar uh, recycling system. And that is very much related to the US security umbrella, as well as Saudi Arabia and the Middle Eastern rich countries. They, probably, they are very much interested in buying US uh, F-16s if they can. <laughs> uh, um, however, China doesn't have that kind of attractiveness. In other words, the renminbi-denominated assets is not at the same level of attraction for 
countries that intends to hold uh, hold the RMB as reserve. So that's another uh, another constraint we'll go, we are going to go back. But it matters here because we are right now in a, in a transition period when the entire global economy, especially among the advanced economies, they are move faster tracking towards green greening their finance, uh, the greening their energy system if the global economy the global economy uh transition towards a greener future the fundamental of the petrodollar recycle system needed to be changed and right now the united states does not really have a comparative advantage in the green energy race and People might say, well, at least in the in the intermediate range, uh, United States is still still has a lot of uh, has has advantage because of shale oil. Now moving beyond shale oil, now there's natural gas. The European Union even categorized natural gas as green energy. But the problem with natural gas, in terms of the use of currencies in commodity pricing, is that natural gas is a very much fragmented market. You really do not have one single global natural gas market, but very much fragmented. Mm -hmm. And this makes the use of alternative currency in the settlement of natural gas in the transitioning period, very attractive. In Asia, in particular, Asia does not have a natural gas trading hub. And China is very much interested in building and expanding the use of renminbi, in, uh, not just it's a natural gas trading hub, but the use of renminbi in pricing and settle natural gas. And China actually has the capacity to do it. Uh, on the one hand, you have Russia as the, uh, to, to the northern border, there are two new pipelines directly connecting Russia and, uh, and the Chinese market. And then on the other hand, China also led two very important regional uh, or non-US-led institute multilateral partnership. One is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And if you think about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a couple of years ago, it was very much a security anti-terrorist uh, organization. But all these countries, they actually are have very rich natural gas uh, exporting uh, capacity. And with the addition of Iran and Saudi Arabia's interest in joining the SCO, now you actually see the Shanghai Cooperation Organization became a very self-contained supplier and a demander dynamic. You have China, you have India. On the one hand, you also have Russia, Iran, Central Asian countries on the other hand. In addition to Shanghai Cooperation Organization, there is also the expanded version of BRICS. BRICS has uh, previously it was Russia, but now with the addition of um, uh, Saudi Arabia and also UAE joined, not to join, also joined the New Development Bank. A lot of these dynamics now you 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 see China lead at least the natural gas block. And the last year when President Xi Jinping visited uh, Riyadh, uh, he specifically talked about the use of renminbi in settle uh, and trading commodities, and in particular he talked about natural gas. So this is why I think it's, uh, although China or the use of renminbi inter as an international currency, in particular as the international reserve currency, there are a lot of constraints. But if the goal is not necessarily to disrupt the dollar or to become the reserve currency, but simply to protect, to provide an alternative or a hedge to access to global liquidities in terms of sanctions, actually the financial plumbing is already there. And then, obviously, in terms of development, in terms of funding, right now, both U.S. and non-U.S. Uh, financial institutions they hold they 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 do not necessarily hold RMB, but they have they have uh, U.S. dollar. And obviously, when you take a look at global uh, um, development finance, both IMF and World Bank, as well as AIIB, or for that matter, New Development Bank, these Chinese leading institutions, they actually rely on dollar finance, despite that they have been quite innovative in terms of developing uh, local. Using uh, trying to develop a local debt market or raising uh, raising alternative uh, capital for financing, and then in terms of investability, this is actually quite uh, quite, quite quite interesting, both in terms of the equity market as well as uh, invest in, in terms of a safe haven asset. We we just lived through a high, uh, high we are still in, in the in the in in in, in the mid of uh, uh, a high inflation here in the in, in the West and uh, when it, when inflation is high we not only see uh, the U.S. Treasury price went down but also uh, because of rate 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 hike but also 
uh, well, investors actually flood into the U.S. market. And this happened not just during, not, not just now, not just during the COVID pandemic. It also happened before, even during the global financial crisis, despite our financial market was in stress, right? So from that perspective, you know, the U.S. dollar is actually very much dominant through all this fair. Now, for any currency that want to systematically break through the dollar's dominance, by, in my opinion, in the short horizon, unless the currency becomes becomes free floating, unless the currency is associated with a deep and very liquid asset market. In other words, you have the analogy of U.S. treasuries. That is basically the benchmark of all other financial asset out there. I mean, that's the zero free risk measurement, right? Unless you have you, you you satisfy these two measurement and then finally uh you, these two measurement, it is literally impossible. And then from a policy wise, from policy perspective, uh, perspective, unless the country's macroeconomic policies can become as dictative as the Federal Reserve or <laughs> perhaps it's it's literally impossible. But if the goal is not necessarily to systematically break break through the dollar system, but rather to hedge against financial uh, hedge against the sanctions, now you actually realize financial plumbing for the purpose of an alternative system in times when you need it, like buying insurance, is actually quite possible. So this is the, the this is why um, I propose these pathways to de-dollarization. Um, framework and in this framework instead of an assertive or active approach to de-dollarize the global financial system this is a very much risk management approach and uh, you know risk managers would think about the risk from two dimensions one is mitigation mechanism and then through what channels you can do it you can do it through market or institutions and uh, you can adapt or uh, take certain strategies do you want to do it yourself or do you want to uh, set up basically set up new institutions, do it yourself, or you want to work with others, try to reform from the within uh, within the existing system. So this is how the box looks like. On the one hand, you have risk mitigation mechanisms through institutions and markets, and then on the other hand, you have mitigation strategies. You can either go it alone or you can reform reform the status quo. So go it alone through institution channels. It simply means you can create a new multilateral financial institutions for non-dollar financing, and you can also promote and try to popularize these non-dollar financial institutions through broader engagement. In other words, you set up a new institution, start from small, and then you try to branch it out. You try to gather broader support. And then from a market perspective, you basically need to create a new financial, in financial instrument, financial assets that a market can accept, that people can trade. You create a volume there. And then you can also create and promote alternative non-dollar financial infrastructure. This basically is like you create a new in information highway, such as the alternative analogy to SWIFT, exactly. Then these are how you can go it along. It basically means you set up new market, new institutions and try to scale it up. And then on the other hand, you can also try to reform from the existing uh, system. This is basically the traditional way that China as well as its uh, partners to try or try try to do from reforming the existing Britain water system or uh, try to uh, reform the existing global reserve currency status. The idea is diversify the existing system rather than build an alternative, right? These are the two very different things. And then reform the status quo also include you try to rearrange the structure of a global equity equity market. Obviously, the US equity market is the biggest and most attractive market. Now, what you can do is try to align your domestic equity market with the understanding that you don't want to free flow, you don't want to open up your domestic uh, financial market. What you can do is to set up investment vehicles such as the ETFs, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you allow limited or controlled trading or you set up, you, you give license to qualified institutional investors into China, like you, the, 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 UAE, the, the UAE and the Saudi institutional investors got them and uh, leading American uh, like BlackRock, uh, BlackRock, Blackstone and the JP Morgan, they have access or City also became uh, qualified, in, in, qualified investors. You have controlled access so that you have 
uh, Chinese market to try to integrate with others. And also, you, you can also have a cross, cross listing uh, in the context of BRICS, they actually achieved that. And the latest development would be Saudi Arabia and China, the Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Saudi Riyadh Stock Exchange. They reached an agreement to, crop, to conduct equity market cooperation. And the idea is, well, you can allow Saudis directly invest into the Chinese market, holding Chinese asset. The idea is perhaps that is a bridge towards the broader holding of Chinese assets as reserves. Now, these are the mechanisms these and uh, mit risk mitigation strategies. So in order to measure how successful they, they can do this, there are, you know, obviously we mentioned earlier, unilateral de-dollarization strategy, imposing the use of renminbi would not necessarily work unless you wage a war and say, you know, you colonize another country. That's uh, in this environment, that's, that's, that's just like, like a joke, right? But, <laughs> but right, that's a bad <laughs> joke. But uh, uh, if you wanted to, if you, in order to, in order to achieve uh, the uh, high level of de-dollarization success, on the one hand, you literally have to work with others to build a coalition by involving more numbers of participants. And then on the other hand, you also have to branch out, not just within your own group, but move beyond your the small group that you started with. So obviously the most, the strongest point in terms of the dollarization would be the uh the top, the top, the top right, right here. You not only build a strong coalition and extend it, but you scale up your own go it along institutions and make that a universal norm. Broad participation, making the alternative a norm. Whereas the weakest one would be the, the lower, the lower, the lower left. Uh, you just have unilateral and you just try to change from the within. The idea is, well, you are still very much constrained within the existing system. And uh, whatever you are trying to achieve, you are not necessarily, you are you are not creating new institutions or new market, and you are not having, you are not building partnership, right? So the way for China to move forward um, in terms of building, in terms of uh, oh, in terms of developing regional de-dollarization and multilateral groups. As I mentioned earlier, you have BRICS as well as the expansion of BRICS and you have Shanghai Cooperation Organization and now you have the Gulf Cooperation Council members. How do I do this? Okay, so uh, the BRICS is a very uh, interesting example, very re relatively robust, given that there is, we, we just had a BRICS expansion. I'll just build on the BRICS, uh, BRICS example here to illustrate. In order to go it along, China, in China launched the new development and the new development bank starting from, 2000, uh, starting from 2000, uh, 2009, 2010, they clearly have this agenda of the promotion of the use of local currency in trade settlement. In, in developing local currency a debt market. And they also conduct local currency loans. The idea is to, on the one, there is a very good economic argument to be made saying that, well, you on the one hand, you reduce transaction costs, you reduce exchange rate costs, and then on the other hand, you uh, minimize the asset liability mismatch from the government per, uh, balance sheet perspective. But then on the other hand, in the case of Russia, in the, in, in the case of the, uh, of the West sanction against Russia. You have this new development bank. On the one hand, you can make the argument to say new development bank now has an identity crisis. To what extent these members are going to continue financing it? And then on the other hand, before you even realize it, now you have new financiers, uh, UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, pledging new money to the new development bank when the bank can no longer uh, safely raise, raise capital in the international currency market, the international market, right? So that's one way to go it along. And then the other way to go it along through institutional measures is uh, through the BRICS plus mechanism. And the BRICS, the reason the expansion of the BRICS actually shows that the BRICS plus is uh, quite a somehow effective mechanism. It used to be the case that BRICS plus was just a term that the president threw out throughout in one of those BRICS summit. And starting from then, BRICS meeting would keep inviting members like the SVO, inviting other members to participate the BRICS summit, 
And before you know it, uh, UAE became a, a, not just a new new development had new members, but BRICS had new new uh, have have expanded. Allegedly, there are something like more than nineteen countries wanting to join the BRICS, and only a, a handful of them are eligible to become the new BRICS members. I think they are going to probably have a hard time trying to figure out what the new name is. But that's the expanded version <laughs> of of BRICS, and uh, the, through this mechanism. Actually, there are active dialogues between the BRICS as well as the uh, SPO in terms of how to promote the use of local currency in trade settlement, uh, in, in, in providing uh, local government, in providing uh, development financing as well. And on top of that, there is the latest conversation between BRICS and uh, SCO is that the SCO is going to move forward towards a economic and a financial cooperation, a cooperation organization. We are interested, the conversation has been shifted from, a uh, security is still very much there, but we are interested in building up the Shanghai cooperation organization version of a new development for the Shanghai Co cooperation organization. And we are very much interested in setting up a Shanghai cooperation organization with a development fund for to provide a similar role uh, of the of financing in terms of reserve management and then in terms of market a very interesting uh, development in uh, in the would be in, related to the oil to the oil and energy instrument and uh, china started this uh, yuan oil futures around 2018 or 2019, uh, around 2018 and uh, within a year it actually surpassed Dubai and Japan in terms of the oil market. Although the transaction volume is still very low, but the yuan oil futures, the use of living deep in pricing oil in Shanghai is very much uh, robust right now. And the conversation, some people even proposed uh, the possible linkage because oil and the gold are all trading in the same market. So perhaps it is not totally inconceivable that a oil a uh, oil trader in Iran can possibly deliver or trade its oil uh, futures in Shanghai in the in the Shanghai oil market using an MND. and then once he resell his oil futures he can use that MND to transfer into gold. The idea is that you have a marketplace to transfer or to exchange oil into gold through the intermediary of Renminbi, even if your intention is not to hold Renminbi as the reserve currency. And then finally, create and uh, create and promote alternative non-dollar financial infrastructure. You already know this a lot. The idea is to create a, a Renminbi an analogy of the SWIFT. But the Renminbi analogy of the SWIFT is actually quite, is quite sophisticated in that it's not just a, uh, messaging system is messaging and the settlement and we are very much interested in uh, promoting the instantaneous or instantaneous a uh, short period or to shorten uh, the transaction uh waiting waiting point right you, you can think about uh the settlement of the using two three mode one is through through corresponding banks it's very much similar to the Fedwire or Fed, the, the, the the chip system here in the united states the partner with the swift system and you need the corresponding banks to deal with folks that are in your system versus folks that are not in your system, right? And then you need the offshore clearing banks that very much so for a long period of time, the media internationalization, all these folks wanted to have their uh, city or like Doha or Luxembourg want to become the offshore the media clearance center. You need those offshore clearance banks to perform the job. But with CITS, you basically can connect everything all together right now. And the interesting part of that is CIPS system using the same coding system as SWIFT. In other words, mm -hmm. if like for all the banks, the transaction, the, the, the switching cost to switch from uh, SWIFT to CIPS system is close to zero because the coding the messaging system is basically, basically the same. So, so let me just answer a quick question, right? Because I always understood that the chip system was still totally reliant on SWIFT. Right? Yes. It's not a separate system. It's so, just it has a separate name. But if it didn't, if SWIFT didn't cooperate with it, it would collapse. Um. So for the CIPS system, uh, the the the, the, the it needs SWIFT system to the extent that it is uh, you need all the banks 
right. that sign up for the SWIFT right. to join the CIPS. Right. And what they have been doing now is trying to incorporate more and more banks to join. The idea is to uh, scale up the CIPS so that you can have messaging and a settlement. Um, but the constraint right now, to your point, Tom, the constraint right now, yes, we, if you look at the website, it is going to show you you have so many par participants and it covers more than more than 4,000 banking institutions and it sounds a lot. Yeah. But most of these banks are Chinese banks overseas. Okay. And the most the most important financial centers in the world, if you say like in New York or in, 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 America, in, in America, they only have one financial institution signed up for the CIPS in North America. Right. So, yeah. that, so the result is that they're still subject to sanction if CERT is cut off there and being told. In, in the current scenario, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And, uh, and that's, that speaks to uh, the constraints of, of the oh. That speaks to the constraints of the uh, of the system. Despite that, they have this very much robust system. You can have uh, you you have the offshore using Swift me messaging system. You can connect it indirectly with your direct participants so that you you can basically connect the offshore with the onshore Chinese banks. In this scenario, you no longer need offshore clearing banks. In other words, in order to trigger sanctions, you need the uh, you need the U.S. government. And the sanctioning enforcement agency to be informed to know the information. But uh, SWIFT actually helps the China to do their own data processing center inside of China. So from in that scenario, if that, that I I do not I, I haven't looked into what that data center one day to be established, what it means. If it means that the international transaction can completely be done through this closed loop of the CIPS system, send a message. Settle and the information is completely run on a parallel system that has nothing to do with the script. And the information is not delivered through uh corresponding banks that are the United that, that are US banks or foreign banks. Then it literally means this remedy cross-border payment and clearing system became a alternative system allowing them to do that's not where we are. So far, we are not there. Yes, very much not, not there yet. And but you know they are they are they are making a very good case to saying that well there are many 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 uh, many many participants already signed up. Um, but if you look into the details of all these U.S. participants in Asia, half of that is inside China. So from that perspective, it's really not doing 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 too much. And the they made those sanctions. Yeah, they, those are those are all Chinese banks in North America. Um. So yes. In North America, yes, the the thirty banks are the thirty banks in North America are all Chinese banks. It's the Chinese banks setting overseas branches. Obviously, it makes sense, you know, it's like sending sending money from abroad to to, to China or the other way. Percent. Right, very much so. And in fact, no, Tom, you're right. And in fact, you know, if if we remember last year, uh, the moment. Uh, one week into one week after Russia's war against uh, Ukraine, what Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, you know there are there are stories, there were stories and speculations about to what extent Beijing would support or help Russia uh, bypass the sanctions. But I guess what happened? You know all these major Chinese banks, including Bank of uh, Bank, Bank of China, ICBC, they started to stop financing Chinese companies by the, the trade credit. They stopped the financing Chinese buying of US uh, buying Russian uh, oil. So the idea is that there is yet yeah, there is this sanction, but there is also this self-sanctioning financial institutions. They are self-sanctioning, so that is actually uh, something very interesting uh, to observe going forward. And uh, uh, another another chart just to quickly illustrate, um, you know, the, the CIPS system, the transaction volume is actually quite uh, has grown quite quite fast from minimum. Um, in the in uh, when it was first launched or testing in 2016 to now, uh, the the last time I had this chart, the available chart was by 2021. It's um it, it more than the, the transaction volume is increased by more than 30 30 times. So from that perspective, the transaction volume increased a lot. But then again, you literally have to bear in mind that this is again the 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 constraints. A lot of participants, and most of those are Chinese. So, from that perspective, the in order for China really to scale this up, maybe in an alternative, you need the participation 
of foreign banks. So far, there are uh, a French bank and a Swiss bank uh, joined uh, the CIPS system, but um, in terms of US banks, no. And he, when we think about going back to, you know, the, those are the goals along that mechanism. And then if we think about the reform, the status quo here um, in the context of BRICS, this is the mechanism that has been approved quite 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 robust in the context of BRICS negotiation. The, 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 after global financial crisis, the very first thing that BRICS did was to um, assert their um, authority, the assert, uh, assert their demand in the context of World Bank and IMF uh, restructuring, and in particular, in terms of FDR reform. And at the same time, they set up the BRICS continuous reserve arrangement. And this applies not just in the context of BRICS. Right now, we, if we fast forward, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and geopolitical tension, the risking, uh, you started to see the revitalization of a new concept in Asia, the so-called Asian uh, Monetary Fund. The idea of the Asian Monetary Fund was first pro proposed by the Japanese, yeah. right? So you didn't like it then. They did. So you, were, I, I, I really wanted to ask you, like, you know, no, the U.S. was opposed. Right? So, yeah, then in Japan, I remember. So <laughs> old enough to remember. In the context when we are talking about the, uh, as if G seven has this unity to sanction Russia, but actually now you have a member of G seven leading the conversation of, uh, oh, you know what? With rising geopolitical tensions, we need some Asian arrangement, and uh, they were sort of. Well, they are not as they are not there yet. You know, the revitalization of this Asian Monetary Fund. At that time, we, we didn't like it. I don't know. If this time we didn't like it. It was the Clinton administration, right? And they they opposed it actively. They said Japan don't take the lead. Remember the dollar? Right, <laughs> right. And uh, this time, I think it's uh, in March. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, of Malaysia visited China and proposed the idea to say we need this. This this uh, Asian Monetary Fund, and he has been very cautious not to say the intention is to be dollarized, yeah. but you know we want to hedge against geopolitical tensions, and we wanted to uh, we, we we wanted to mitigate the negative impact of the U.S. dollar on our own economy. So, um, how far are they in terms of the BRICS, in terms of the the Asian uh, the ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus China, Japan, South Korea? How far are they from creating an alternative Asian Monetary Fund? Some people wouldn't even argue that it's not that far away because in 2000, um, in two, in two, by the end of 2009, um, Asian countries, ASEAN plus three, already launched the uh, Asian Foreign Exchange Reserve Pool. It's a pooled reserve self-governed for the use of members, ASEAN plus three members, in terms of uh, liquidity shortage so that they can reduce their reliance on the IMF. So from that perspective, you, you, you see not just the BRICS, but also the US allies. Japan um, is very much interested in this idea. So uh, this actually leads to the economic aspect of why countries are, are interested in the use of local currencies, in trade or investment specifically because well, you know, every time if you don't, if, if you happen to not be the U.S. Treasury or Federal Reserve, you don't have the privilege to print U.S. dollar. Then every time when you are you are trading with a, another country, especially if you are a country like China, you are the largest trading partner for more than a hundred countries in the world. Every time you do a transaction, you go to a bank, you 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 suffer from at least the two things: transaction costs and the bank fees, as well as exchange rate costs. So if you are able to use your own local currency in bilateral trade. That probably is a significant saving. And then on the other hand, there is the added uh, geopolitical risk, right? So it the so economic reasons actually sort of put um, US allies sort of on the same page as country, other countries that intend to promote the use of non-dollar currencies. And this is, um, I think, uh, the bank, former uh, Bank of England governor, Marcus Carney, the shift in the point. 2019, when he came to the United States at the Jackson uh, Hole Symposium. He basically told everybody, every single banker in the world, uh, in, in the room, say that, well, you know, like the the the, the single most important, the single most the single biggest threat to the global financial system right now is the dominance of the U.S. dollar. Therefore, he proposed that we establish a basket of currencies to 
um, as as an alternative. But he, I think he's not the only the first person proposed that idea. I think PNZ and other person, other people already proposed that idea earlier. But see, the, the the common thread here is that you don't really have to be a U.S. strategic rival in order to appreciate why it is important mm -hmm. to use local currency. And this leads to the use of local currency in trade and settlement. You, they, this is um, basically within the existing system, either you uh, through FT free trade agreement or you simply give people uh, bilateral currency swaps. This is another thing where China is doing this very different from the United States. The US only very reluctant, the Federal Reserve are very reluctantly giving uh, swaps to, to other countries. And it was only during the financial crisis it expanded to other countries, to a few more countries, whereas the PBOC signed so many foreign, uh, so many uh, Foreign, uh, the, the, so many um, currency swaps with other countries through BRI or even not BRI countries. So the idea is to give countries the incentive to use renminbi and in particular for trade facilitation. And then finally, the BRICS Stock Exchange Alliance. This is something that uh, actually not started at the local, at, not started by the central government. The uh, uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange started proposing this. So. Uh, you see this being, you see this entire mechanism go it along, reform the status, reform the status quo being played both within China and through BRICS and through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the latest development would be the Gulf Cooperation Council members. Um, so now you, I sort of waved into the conversation about the constraints of China's de-dollarization initiatives. First of all, the, I, you know there are so many different 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 constraints, but the three most important constraints are: first, there is no attractive in the asset. In other words, there is no Chinese asset means that without your are interested in buying, and for that matter, there is not necessary for also for security purposes and for trade for security purposes, countries that are interested in holding that reserve may not necessarily have the same incentive as holding a uh, Chinese. Uh, and indeed as reserves. And then find, uh, secondly, they have to control certainly does not help. The idea that these are not to when they need the money, we really want to swap the money off, outside of the market and the uh, capital control simply does not allow you to do that. That is another constraint. And then thirdly, related to energy, we talked about the energy transformation and why it is very important for, uh, for us to actually try to figure out how to maintain the dollars, dollars Competitive advantage in a develop, you know, you know, a greener um, world. Here, China seems to have a very have a uh, comp competitive advantage there because the government is very much interested in the use of the needed price in oil and uh, uh, natural gas and also crucial minerals. But a very important constraint is that China has a very much fragmented domestic market. The idea is that yes, China as an aggregate is the largest oil and gas importing country, but if you look, it, look into Chinese domestic market, it's very much fragmented. And every every province aspires to have their own trading market. And the oil destinate for Shanghai is not necessarily going to be allowed to trade to a different or ship to a different location. So from that perspective, when you um when you sort of disaggregated the big Chinese importing into all these different provinces with their own local incentives, it becomes less clear whether the Renminbi could become this uh, pricing currency to settle China's uh, import of gas in particular. Um, but again, despite all these result constraints, I think it's important to acknowledge that if the goal is really not about the control of the dollar, but rather hedge against the sanctions, hedge against the coercive economic statecraft, the exercise of coercive economic statecraft. And what you what China only needs is build this alternative system, it's like buying insurance, you buy it hoping that you don't use it, but in case you need it, you have the facility ready to go so that you can at least have access to international liquidity. So from that perspective, I think China have China, the Chinese government and policymakers have already developed the um, financial infrastructure. It only needs time for them to scale it up through different regional blocks.
So that's the uh, presentation. And uh, yes, Tom mentioned that the book that uh, I did during my time at uh, uh, the China and the World program, this is that book. She's a superstar. I mean, this book gets so much attention. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Well, so I'm going to start the questions by asking one that you probably get all the time, because you started by saying that uh, there were constraints on China's ability to truly de-dollarize, not just to create these these hedge uh, hedges against sanctions. Um, and one was about uh, that unwilling to float the currency, right? Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, whether you think uh, that could change anytime soon. Um, in other words, uh, the desire for international power and prestige through having a, a global leading currency is one incentive right. and domestic control is the other incentive, right. and you know you can tell where I'm leaning. Yeah. I lean towards domestic control yeah, yeah, yeah. against against the international sea. So, so what what is your sense? Is the is the desire for that domestic control so robust that China is extremely unlikely to move into that place? And then you mentioned something else that people have said to me before, but maybe you can explain it to me better than I understand, which is to have the leading currency. People have said to me, you have to be, you have to run a deficit. <laughs> So, because that's what treasury bonds are, right. right? You have to produce something the equivalent of treasury bonds. To produce treasury bonds, you have to get people to buy your debt, which means you have to be in debt. Right. And do you think the Chinese government wants to be in heavy debt uh, internationally so that it can have a stronger currency? So there's two two separate questions about the renminbi's ability to become a true rival uh, or some BRICS currency to become a true rival. Right. All right, that's it. Right, thank you, Tom. I think uh, for the second part, I think Michael Pettis and other people would would, would, would make the, the case to say you really need to be a uh, to to be a deficit country in order to at least trade a deficit country in order to basically the other side with the, the, the net uh, financial account positive. Right, I'll come back to that. And I, I and the think, U.S. is great at that. Right. <laughs> And I think every time when we buy something on Amazon, we probably contribute. We, we, compute, we contribute to American power by contributing to American debt. Right. <laughs> so on the first part, on the first part, well, domestic control versus uh, international prestige. Uh, I think if we have this conversation before 2013, uh, I, I think my, my answer might be different because the Chinese economy was growing at a different stage, but now, um, the a lot of the structural forces combined with geopolitical tensions um, really make the Chinese economy in a very tough, very difficult shape. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think the Chinese government, at, at least if, viewing from the government policy initiative starting from December last year to now, the government has been emphasizing on the one hand promoting domestic consumption and specifically emphasizing consumption-led growth by prioritizing household consumption. And I think it's, uh, if I remember it correctly, this is the first time that the government put household consumption promotion ahead of government-led uh, invest uh, effective investment. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I think economically that's, that's good, but that also means you would have to find ways to support the household. So far there is not necessarily, we haven't seen that coming mm -hmm. yet. And uh, what, do we, what do we do observe is that the government, in particular China's technocrats, have been very, uh, very, very innovative. They find the ways to boost the China's financial market without liberalizing it, mm -hmm. right? So th that's why I don't think the appetite is there yet in terms of liberalizing. It. If anything, when the renminbi was renminbi was de de depreciated, I, I would I would feel bad if I am a Chinese student studying studying right now paying American tuition because yeah. simply because dollar so strong. I, I know, right? Yeah. You, you simply have to pay pay your tuition simply have to be you know more expensive because of exchange rate so from that perspective you know and what the chinese did was pboc intervene mm -hmm. so uh if it were allowed to be to to flat to to float then obviously this is, would be the moment where you like okay so cheap mean be good for export let's go but actually they didn't do that yeah so that's another piece of evidence i don't think the the motivation is there yet and related to that I think um, perhaps at least I have been underestimated. I have been um, I at, when I started revising my my, uh, my my book manuscript during my time here at the CWP. I started to pay more attention, more. I started to appreciate more about the importance of financial security as viewed by the Communist Party 
than I previously did. Previously, I thought, you know, Xi Jinping was the person who emphasized financial security in his comprehensive national security um, concept. But actually, ever after Asian financial crisis, the idea of financial security has been deeply ingrained in generations of Chinese leaders. And even when I was reading um, uh, um, Zhu Rongji's memoir, he actually said, Foreign exchange reserves are not just economic power, it's also political power. He yeah. said that. Yeah. So from that perspective, I think it explains why China, A, on the one hand, accumulate foreign exchange reserves continuously, and B, they don't necessarily have the appetite to free float the currency. Mm -hmm. uh, because free float, the, they learned that the hard way from China, from Japan, mm -hmm. South, South Korea, but then obviously if you let your, your, your you let it float, it uh, could very much mean China would have, is going to run a huge trade deficit, because, and that really leads to your second point, which is you know uh, when the right as China's industrial as China climb up the industrial supply chain, all the cheap manufactured 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 goods like toys, umbrellas. They have uh, moved out yeah. from China. So the right now the Chinese economy really suffered from. Uh, an existential threat, which is the industrial, the traditional industrial, the industrial sectors hollow out to Southeast Asia and other places mm -hmm. before China can climb up the industrial train because mm -hmm. of the export controls and and the technology yeah. having a hard time accessing to advanced technology because it is simply now it is simply becomes too expensive yeah. now if you think about the policy options that the chinese government can do in terms of interaction interacting with the rest of the world you on the one hand facing severe domestic uh, expenditure uh, demand from social welfare to local government debt if that's another problem they need to figure out who suffer the cost and then uh coming out of coming out of covid household needs support and yet they haven't given it yet and then obviously there are a, a, a huge way a huge swath of um local government needs to in terms of their social welfare it is expenditure and then on the other hand you also face uh more more difficult access to foreign technologies that is going to significantly raise China's R&D cost. I'm not saying that China is not going to achieve technology uh, progress. China actually had, you know, under, um, in the 1950s, China under extreme international mm -hmm. isolation, you know, hydro, uh, like atomic bomb and yeah. hydrogen bomb. Yeah, so, and missiles. It, right, <laughs> missiles. So from that perspective, China has not, or the CCP in particular, ha is not unfamiliar with international isolation. But the cost of the international isolation now is okay. more significant than China in the 1950s and the 60s. So the government really have to decide what do they want to do. But, you know, if uh, letting the renminbi free floating and removing capital control uh, perhaps is going to be trigger more financial in, in, more financial insecurity, and there is also the, the 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 fear. The moment you remove the capital control, there is going to be a huge amount of Chinese money going out abroad. Yeah. So I I think I I don't think they are going to uh, free flow the RMB, and I don't think they have the appetite to run deficit. I just say one last thing, which is the Malaysians were the one country during the ninety seven crisis that froze their currency and stopped floating it. Oh, okay. So it's interesting that the Malaysians are the ones who went to China saying we need an Asian a monetary fund. That's interesting. Because they were, they're not opposed to control. That's interesting. I have a question about the other country, other countries like Russia, Saudi, South Africa, whoever. Right. And I can understand that in a simple basis, we're going to buy and sell something with China and use renminbi. It's okay. Yeah. But as soon as things get a little more complicated and you want to buy renminbi, sell renminbi, trust the Chinese government to keep the renminbi value vis-a-vis -vis other currencies stable and so on and so forth, you've got risk. Right. So unless you're Russia and you have the same need to proof yourself against sanctions, which most countries don't have that need so much. I mean, they may, I suppose nobody trusts the United States, but most, most countries are not on the brink of being sanctioned by the <laughs> So isn't that a reason why other countries don't want to get too deep into Renminbi? 
I think that's a that's a great point. Uh, some there are some uh, New York Fed New, New York Fed researchers look into the security, uh, the security and the dollar reserve do, dollars dominant reserve currency status, and uh, their research found that act, actually more than more than forty percent of the dollar reserves are ho are held by countries that are either U.S. allies or uh, countries that have security are um, uh, dependent on the United States for for security. So from that perspective, um, I think that you, you are right, Professor uh, Nathan, in terms of uh, you know, for countries that are not necessarily on the brink of being sanctioned by by China, they probably don't. But by the United States, their incentive to hold their RMB as a reserve currency probably is is, is very little. Um, but the I think there is an economic argument to be made in the sense that, uh, especially for developing countries who are very much dependent on China for uh, aid or investment and for for trade. So the use of RMB to settle bilateral trade, on the one hand, can reduce their 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 own risk because if you are already trading with China a lot, that basically means you can use the you can use what China pays you and then use that to buy goods from China, right? So, but right now, you know, the the foreign exchange market is is structured such that not all currencies. Can directly find a trading pair. The China, China RMB and, and U.S. dollar, RMB and Euro, sure, but RMB and uh, a Botswana currency or, or Congo currency probably is, is a different story. In other words, the 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 more steps that you have to go in order to facilitate a trade to finish a transaction, the higher the cost could be. So I think that makes sense for countries who are already a large trading partner with China to go further ahead. But I agree with you in terms of holding reserve, RMB as reserves is a different story. And I was actually thinking about trade yeah. because when you trade, you don't always come out with zero. Yeah. You either need more RMB or you have extra RMB, so you have to do conversion. Right, therefore, if uh, this, the PBOC can further facilitate that by extending a currency swap, and uh, the PV, the the there is also the Ch China has this uh, export government owned um, export export credit insurance company who do both long term and short term trade facilitation. In yeah. other words, you have both the insurance and the currency swaps that facilitate the trade that facilitate the trade. But then on the other hand, even for country, even for a lot of these DRI countries and the countries that receive a lot of Chinese investment. We would prefer to have Chinese investment be not using U.S. dollar rather than RMB because um, there is only, from their perspective, there is only a limited number of goods that we can buy directly yeah. using RMB. But the, for the majority of stuff that we would prefer to buy, like oil, you still need to buy using dollar. So there, there, there is this demand mismatch. You can feel the questions. Uh, sure. Is that going over? Oh, the other professor needs a question. One specific example I was looking at was um currently there you know are talks between Russia and India for um paying uh, for weapons um and commodities like fertilizer and oil, but the Russians don't want to accept rupees, and I I think they can't go through the dollar, right? So isn't that a, a good example of when the um the Indians and the Russians could use renminbi? And why why are why do they choose not to go? With that option so far. That's an interesting point. I think I need to ask some Indian scholars or Russian scholars on the exact point. But uh, you know, the Indi, the Indian rupee, uh, the India, uh, Russia, India, or Soviet, uh, so Soviet uh, India had already in the fifties. They had this arrangement of rupee ruble transaction mechanism. They didn't. So right now, it's just a resume of the old old, old mechanism. The mechanism was already there for a long period of time, and uh, Russia actually support about sixty percent of India's or more than sixty percent of India's uh, arms and. And India also imported a lot of oil denominated in non-dollar currencies. It was previously was rupee ruble, but then they decided that both countries agreed to settle using a UAE's currency, UAE dinar. So that and right now UAE dinar be, literally become this um, uh, for lack for lack of a better word or analogy, it becomes this um, um, Gulf 
a Switzerland, if you will. It's like, you know, every every financial transaction can happen. And it's not just about a trade. There is also uh, how the cargoes are getting insured. So basically, you have all these different brokerage agencies in uh, UAE that can facilitate the trade. So perhaps that's why they decided to from a, a com So I, I think the economic explanation would be uh, UAE is the natural hub to facilitate all sorts of these kind of transactions. And obviously, UAE has the uh, facility to trade RMB as to trade you trade trade for RMB as well, but I I don't know Tom probably you know better than I do like the area of geopolitical tension. Don't know better than you Zoe. Um, <laughs> no, I I think you know a lot. Um, but I I also think the UAE is a good third uh, party participant because the United States doesn't want to sanction the UAE, right? They want to have good relations with the UAE, so they're kind of they're kind of uh, um protected, immunized right. from, from U.S. Right. sanctions. Right. Yeah, yeah, and just, yeah, general strategic relations in the Middle East. You don't want to alienate all of your friends at once, mm -hmm. even though, you know, we sometimes do a good job. Right. <laughs> yeah. So given your argument that uh, China can have a typical coalition inside to control the goals, and also um, identity sanctions, and also your point there, you see that yes, there's not much international reason to the regions and banks in five countries. How do you explain China's strategy to connect the yes with Russia and Iran's strategy? If right. those two connected, I think China would be clear. I think they may form the choice to find it, but China doesn't just think about it. Right, that's an excellent point. I think uh, Russia, even before the war, you know, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, Russia's um, different levels of officials, uh, from finance minister or, or foreign minister, visited China at all different meetings. They, they proposed to connect with Russia's SPFS with with the IPS. Um, but the the point, but you know, uh, I don't think I haven't talked with any Chinese officials why why they why they they, they they are not doing it at this moment. They probably don't want to talk to me. Um, uh, <laughs> so you know a lot. <laughs> but but um, uh, but you know the 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 rationale is that Russia's SPFS. It's very much a domestic domestic arrangement. Despite the Russian central bank would say that, oh, you know, we are going to revolutionize this with the Russian version of the central bank digital currency. But hey, Chinese already pioneered it, and we are going to use the Hong Kong as the the the, the entry port to to even test the broader use of the digital RMB on on top of the CIPS system, right? So from that perspective, the Russian system is very much domestic domestic oriented. And is Russia, the Russia S SPFS system, they had two other Russian banks participating in outside of Russia in Europe. In other words, China really does not need uh, to connect the Chinese institutions with the Chinese CIPS, with the Russian, Russian ones in order to achieve broader views. And on top of that, there is also a local government aspect there as well. Uh, you probably paid, a paid attention to this. Xi Jinping did not go to the G20, but he, he, he visited China's Rust Belt in Heilongjiang. And Heilongjiang was also last May, as the war and sanctions all you know raining down upon Russia, Heilongjiang local government party head made this statement saying that Heilongjiang is going to continue uh, carry on uh, deepening, opening up to the north. <laughs> and the deepening up to the opening up to the north is basically Russia, right? And this time Xi Jinping basically made the same argument to say that you know it's going to continue deepening up uh, deepening up high quality, deepen up high quality open up to the north. Uh, so I, I think it, it, it it's interesting that there is a local government involvement in there. Obviously, Heilongjiang traditionally is a very important trading partner at the local government level with 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 Russia, but then at the same time. Um, there is also this de regional de-dollarization initiative going on. Local bank of there is this one uh, Heilongjiang, one bank, one regional bank in Heilongjiang called Heilongjiang Bank. It's like a small, medium-sized bank uh, hosted by Heilongjiang local government, mm -hmm. and that bank actually is among the earliest to become a direct participant to China's CIPS system. And we have strategic partnership with two major Russian deposit-taking banks. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, you really do not need China's 
system to connect with the Russians in order to expand the use of RMB through regional trade or promoting trade with Russia. Plus, uh, China and Russia, you know, when they built the pipeline, they already had some agreement to say, okay, so this the, 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 the gas is going to be paid and settled at, you know, in RMB anyways. And on top of that, they actually, part of the, if you read the RMB internationalization report published by the uh, PBOC every year, they actually show one important measurement is cross-border movement of RMB in cash. Like just a physically moving cash across the border is an important measurement for RMB internationalization. And uh, they actually did that. When, when there is this cross-border bridge between Heilongjiang, uh, between China's Heilongjiang province and Russia, when this bridge uh, or finished, completed. They did a test run. There's this big truck, like tra tracking Chinese cash into 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 uh, into into Russia. So it's kind of interesting. So what? what are, do I know other people should ask questions. I I can't resist. But go ahead. I can resist. I'm just asking a question on the case of your argument. So even uh, it's simply impossible to defraud dollar hegemony systematically, and that what China is doing is simply strengthening their financial security then. Why we just keep saying uh, that the United States is overstanding this story? Is it possible because uh, uh, is it because um, they want to mobilize the metrics support like how this person book argues? Like uh, for, for example, uh, to to have dollar hegemony, you need to accept the national debts. Uh, and in order to persuade my population to accept it, I oversell this story that the uh, Chinese government is trying to give on our dollar for Germany. So we need to keep um, making that, <laughs> keep saving dollars. It's a good way to do it to Matt Gates, man. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up, Matt. You're going to make us weak. <laughs> so, why are we saying this for real? Um, Chinese people doing it. Um, all that again. So that's a that's a good point, Tom. You, you I, I I see it very, I see it very different. I, I I just as a comment, you know, I, I I see it very differently. The people the people who I see talking about the rise of the renminbi and the rise of BRICS currency are usually uh, fantastically critical of American foreign policy. And they say all this stuff you're doing, all these sanctions you're leveling against Russia, all this support for Ukraine, all of the sanctions on Iran, all of the sanctions on Cuba are, are going to delegitimize the dollar and weaken America and you should cut it out mm -hmm. rather than the U.S. government mobilizing the population around the idea of debt. Um, and debt is usually considered with some embarrassment, you know, in the, in the political realm in the United States. I mean, there's lots of it, despite that, but it's not something that people usually brag about. I was kind of kidding before that by by using Amazon, you're strengthening America because you're producing more treasury bills and uh, strengthening the dollar. But um, there is something to that, that to have the world reserve currency, you have to be printing something like treasury bonds and you're printing treasury bonds because you're running debt. Um, and the but U.S. is an economic benefit to running there, which is cheap products, cheap products, and also the ability to just print currency because the whole world's using your currency. You can make your own decisions for the rest of the world. Senior age, I don't know how to say Actually, it. Actually, the practice. American dollar is not worth losing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anyone thrown on the floor. Though. <laughs> there is another it's an interesting point that you raised in terms of you know the uh, the, 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 the the political narrative about it right and uh i i i completely agree with tom you know like for people who who are very enthusiastic about the idea of I mean, like Did a Chinese, you, yeah. Chinese scholar like Yu Yongding wrote this uh, article on um, Project Project Syndicate, criticizing, yeah. oh, you know, the moment of America, yeah. you know, America sanctioned other countries is one story, but when America, the America's decision to freeze the Russian reserves, that's a complete different whole category yeah. Yeah. of actions, and this is a violation of international norm, and so on and so forth. But the problem is, you know, like the, the problem is, you know, you are you you the the he 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 recognized. He, he, I think he, you know, a lot of these Chinese scholars are frustrated by the fact that the U.S. dollar, the the, the international system is just so plugged because around the U.S. dollar and you know countries can just or individuals, individuals and financial institutions can simply be be cut off instantaneously, right? And uh, I think people who think that China or other countries can simply dethrone the US dollar overnight or you know foreseeable future without doing anything without doing any, any financial liberalization or make free change of their currency reserves or but ignore the fact that 
A, you need exchange, goes back to the point, you need to be willing to buy stuff. And B, you also, there is also another uh, relatively underappreciated term, which is the international financial norms, accounting standard and the laws, the security in the mergers and acquisition lawyers, they're all American. It's, if you look at Deutsche Bank or any other, or, or for that matter, all, all these policy advisors for major European banks, they're actually all American. Yeah, uh, yeah. In other words, the the rules and the norms underwritten the global financial system is still very much dollar based, like it or not. So from that perspective, is the dollarization means okay? So you use the Chinese currency or other currency, but you still behave in a dollar denominated rules, and you still have the Department of Justice or you know any U.S. government be the referee of the system. You still cannot achieve the ultimate goal of the dollarization. So I think the rule aspect is also very important. So go, if I, I I don't know if everybody understands it, but the, the way that uh, the Treasury Department can wield power is not just by uh, by seizing Russian reserves, um, but the the, uh, the the indirect sanctions that are leveled is an incredible source of American power. And uh, the first time I saw it was uh, Banco Delta Asia in, in uh, Macau, which was handling North Korean money, and they came under U.S. Treasury sanctions. And this scared every bank in the world to the degree that no bank would deal with North Korea. And the way the Treasury does it is say, if you deal with a bad country, we will not let your, let your bank use dollars and transact. It's a total crippling of all international bank. Um, and it really hurt the North Koreans when they said so. Um, they couldn't find any bank place to, 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 to bank at all. Um, so it's not just that Russia is being targeted for, for uh, invading Ukraine, which is real, it's a severe sanction. But any country that deals with Russia in dollars, and this is why Russia has truckloads of renminbi literally crossing the borders, right? Because they can't do any transactions with dollars. Because any bank outside of Russia that does dollar transactions with Russia under sanctions is then going to be cut off from the ability to use dollars itself. So it's a, it's an incredible tool, and it's usually go to get back to your question. It's usually the critics of American foreign policy say. You're overusing your tool, you're being too coercive, and what's going to happen? You're going to wake up one day and the red and B is going to be the leading currency, not the dollar. And I always respond to these people, well, we, maybe the, maybe there's too much coercion, maybe there is going to be sanctions, but that's not going to happen because they always thought they can't. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one of your charts said uh, that changing domestic institutions is necessary for the success of uh, a certain type of hedging strategy. And um, I heard uh, a lot of discussion from you today about changing policy. Um, occasionally, you would use the word say, liberalization, it sounded like not just a policy, but changing institutions. But I was wondering if you could flesh out what changing institutions would mean in a tangible way. And uh, if, if you could uh, map that on to uh, some standard that's necessary for some degree of hedging. So, does China have to liberalize by the white institution to meet a U.S. standard or to meet a Japanese standard of openness and uh, free floatingness and depth and so forth? Uh, and then how is this related to the thing that is to be hedged against? So one could imagine uh, trying to hedge against um, some kind of leaky, uh, superficial sanctions regime. One could imagine trying to hedge against a really airtight sanctions mm -hmm. regime. One could imagine trying to hedge against a naval blockade. So, um, could, could you uh, 
kind of paint that picture with uh, a little bit more detail. I think I have a new PhD dissertation to write. Go for it, Dr. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, sure, you know, in terms of trying to the the in terms of institutional reform to achieve liberalization, I think at this moment you really need to fundamentally reform uh, the economic growth model based upon financial repressions. Because we can think about the Chinese growth model uh, based upon export driven or investment driven by the state, right? But ultimately, the government is able to. Uh, have this export-driven uh, growth model to accumulate foreign exchange reserves and to have a state channel all, 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 all possible resources into state-preferred uh, strategic sectors, which is a subject that a lot of our CWP uh, uh, fellows uh, look, look into. You know, the fundamental reason that the government can do that or the party can do that is because of the perfection of a system, financial repression system of which the party and the government is at, placed at the center. And it's not just the, the you know, it's not just the, the banking system that builds around the Chinese economic growth model that matters. It's also the incentives as well as uh, the network and the institutions around it. If you compare the Chinese system with the United States, very much so one can make the argument to say the Chinese economic model is very much the Germans in the sense that it's very much bank oriented rather than venture capital led. And China learned about venture capital from America, from retired or vetful Wall Street veterans and all that, right? So from that perspective, in order really to liberalize the Chinese economy, you need to change the financial repression model as well as the institutions around it. That basically means party state at the center of the capital allocation, sitting on top of the state owned commercial banks. You need to not only have a state commercial banks, but also have a more competitive banking institution, allowing interest rate to be more free, more, more competitive, more free floating in the domestic market. And tagged with that, you also need a more free floating currency rather than have an offshore and uh, onshore market. And this goes back to Tom's point. I, I just, especially when the economy is in the current status, I, I don't think the political appetite is there yet. The idea is that, you know, obviously, you know, the SASAC has more than a hundred, uh, about a hundred, I mean, 1998 something, um, uh, numbers of gover central government controlled state owned enterprises. And these would have preferential access to credit. You imagine the moment when market can dictate capital allocation. Perhaps these guys are not necessarily going to be the guys that are being treated in preferential terms by the banks. And that is going to be not in contradictory with the current pol government policy in terms of strengthening the state and the party's dominance in the system. Therefore, you know, again, in order to liberalize the Chinese economy, you, you literally need this. You, at, at least speaking from a finance researcher's perspective, I think you really need to revamp the financial the financial system, you need the financial system to be more competitive, you need market to allocate a credit, you need consumers to decide the product and import rather than the government decide, you know, these government put out a you know consumption guidelines to say we want people to consume more electric vehicles or, or things like that. You know, so so that's why I think it's not there yet. You know, in order, in order to to in order to build a liberalized system to hedge against the sanctions. First of all, I think if China were to liberalize, if China were really becoming a consumption-driven uh, economy, letting households decide what they want, perhaps the trade deficit issue with the United States could be more or less modified. Because you know, on the one hand, you have tourism. You have tourism. You would uh, you have more education. You would have more Chinese people buying American cell phones or av avocados or or things like that. Exactly, to Remember Asia. Remember tuition. Tuition, <laughs> yes. And you would, obviously you would have more, at least you would see more Chinese families sending their, you know, I grew up, I, I consider myself as well as many of our CWP fellows as the poster children of good U.S.-China relations. People like us, we want to come to the United States. We think this is a good opportunity. But now, especially during COVID, this is something that worried me a lot. On the one hand, you see propaganda on WeChat and all that. People are saying that, oh, you know, Tsinghua and all these leading, leading universities are cultivating 
uh, basically traders who come to the United States, stay in the United States, they don't come back to China. And then on the other hand, you also uh, see people say, oh, well, you know, I did not, go, these students didn't go to America to study instead of stayed in China is a good thing. You know, this is, the, the, the reverse is something really worrying me. And then on top of that, there is also some university um, re recently relinquished the, the requirement of English education as a degree requirement, I think it's a bad signal in the sense that it could very well be interpreted as China is no longer interested in participating in the rest of the world. You know, English is a you know a world language. And for foreigners to learn Chinese, it takes a lot of time. Uh, really? But <laughs> you might be a, you might be an exception. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, um, but you know, but you know, the degree. You know, I, I personally don't necessarily think relinquishing English requirement, the English requirement, the English language exam as a requirement for college degree would in any way improve or decrease Chinese Chinese college kids. Uh, English language capacity because exam themselves they, they they really do not come significantly improve your communication skill but it's a bad signal it's really a bad signal so again uh, this you know the language piece would definitely contribute to the liberalization part but in order to hedge against I think China has been doing a comprehensive way to hedge against various of. Uh, coercion militarily or economically. Uh, many of our CWP fellows have done research on naval power and the naval bases. And uh, we also have fellows do uh, research on uh, Chinese economic coercion, the use of that carrot and, uh, and sticks. Uh, Audrey Wang did that. And uh, but overall, you see China's behavior is expressed. And we also have, uh, you know, uh, uh, Courtney did think related to the United Nations. So basically, you see China is almost like a is it like hedgehogs or, uh, or fox having all these different spikes, right? And they're trying to do a lot of things. And what the the most, uh, the part that I, I have followed closely are in three areas. One is naval port. Uh, I'm going to launch a port interactive that looks into Chinese investment into global ports down to how many shares that China owns in terms of equity investment and uh, and or operational rights. So you can find that probably later part of this month on CFR website. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll also I'll also send uh, CW, CWP, my, my, my fellows here, uh, a link. So basically, China, so the, have, the, 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 this, this is important in terms of the hedging because China obviously does not have the naval naval power, and I don't think the Chinese that, that that's the wise and the most efficient way to allocate the Chinese military budget. Um, but a simple way could be, given that China has invested in more than a hundred ports globally, and for certain port, ports, China even control one hundred percent of the port authority, like in Greece or Paris. So from that perspective, uh, coercive, coercive coercion or reactive behavior to American or Western Coerce, economic coercion could be as simple as my banana boat came show up at the port and yet you know nobody is processing my paperwork and when things are perishables now you know this is going to be economic loss right so I think a port port is important and then the other thing that I follow closely would is the China's development of of alternative financial infrastructure that I presented today it's not really about the dollarization China is going to be the largest loser in the dollarized world. And think about it, China has three trillion foreign exchange, uh, more than three trillion official foreign exchange reserves. And then on top of that, Some more. right, also have the hidden reserves and the state-owned Chinese commercial Chinese entities also have also have heavy exposure in America and 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 Europe. So uh, you know the dollarized world or any volatility in the dollar value China is is going to suffer. That's that's why I think China does have genuinely have the incentive or have a stake in the stability of a dollar-based system, but it developed alternative to hedge against, it. let's say, military conflict with Taiwan or any other possible scenarios like that. And then the third area that I follow closely would be the legal legal development. China has not only developed its own entity list or its own export control list, and on China's export control list, it include not just you know critical minerals and or uh, the Chinese calligraphy, a paper special making techno making the Chinese paper right uh, or Chinese herbal medicine. It also include um, the the latest draft include the um, the processing of several critical minerals, the processing technology and the machinery. So in other words, China is building up 
is reaction to America's export control list, as well as the legal aspect of it. The idea is forcing American business or, or a European business to potentially choose between the Chinese market, having the Chinese market or not. Those are the three areas that I follow, but my other CWP fellows follow closely in terms of China's interaction with global uh, global institutions and all that.